Hello and welcome to the Software Engineering Unlocked podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michaela, and today I have the pleasure to talk to Jonathan Scharwitt, author of the book Data-Oriented Programming. But before I start, let me tell you a bit about my latest project, awesomecodereviews.com. Yeah, all my work on code reviews has now its own dedicated home. At awesomecodereviews.com, you find articles about code review best practices, code review checklists, news about the latest research on code reviews, and of course, workshops and courses that I offer around this topic. So please hop over to awesomecodereviews.com and check out my latest work. But now, back to Jonathan. Jonathan is a software developer, author, and speaker. He has tons of experience in full-stack development using various languages such as Java, JavaScript, Ruby, but his favorite language is Clojure. And he bundled and packaged all of his experience and knowledge into his new book, Data-Oriented Programming. This is also the reason why I invited him today. And uh, so I'm super thrilled that I will dive with him into how to design and build software that deals with information. So, Jonathan, thank you so much for being on my show. Welcome here. Hello, Michaela. I'm very glad to be here with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm also really thrilled. And I heard that you're giving away one of your books, a digital copy of your books, to one of my listeners. So um, what do you have to do to, to win this book? Well, retweet today's episode and like it. And, and then you're in the pod to get one copy of um, data-oriented programming from uh, Jonathan. So, but yeah. Jonathan, what is this book actually about? Okay, so this book is about a simple way to reduce complexity of information systems. And by, that, by information systems, I mean a program that manipulates data that doesn't belong to the program, data that comes from the outside world. For mm -hmm. example, a front-end application that receives data from a back-end or a back-end application that fetches data from a database or an API. It could be also a web worker that reads data from uh, RabbitMQ or Kafka and needs to process it and passes it forward. So all those systems have in common that they manipulate data But the data does not belong to him. The data or the information existed before the program and will continue to exist after the program uh, dies. Mm -hmm. And those kind of systems, uh, which is basically what we do on our day-to-day -day basis as full-stack developers, need, uh, I think, a different and a simpler approach to how we uh, represent data inside our programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I realized that when I when I looked at the first topic or the first subtitle, unlearning objects, it was very, very clear to me that it somehow has something to do with object-oriented programming and that you want actually a paradigm shift here. And uh, you, you know, you you think now about data-oriented programming more or less, right? And so that this can somehow improve our applications and probably our maintainability. So what is that shift from object-oriented programming to data-oriented programming? And, and why should we unlearn objects? <laughs> okay, that's a great question. And uh, let me tell you uh, how I see it. I practice uh, meditation. I've been practicing meditation for around 10 years now. And to me, there is quite a similarity between what meditation guides us to do and objects. So in meditation, the basic assumption or the basic uh, principle is that the main cause of our suffering doesn't have to do with the reality itself, but it has to do with the way we perceive reality. Mm -hmm. So we, our mind projects something, an object, on the reality. And this object causes us suffering. But the reality on itself does not cause any suffering. And meditation guides us to remove the glasses that our mind puts on reality and to look at the reality as it is. And if you are able for a moment to look at a flower as an idea, If you are lucky enough to experience that, it's a joyful experience. And even pain, if something is painful, if you are able just to feel 
the feeling of the pain with no interpretation of the mind, with no meaning about what does it mean about me, but just experiencing the pain as a, a physical trigger, then the pain is not as painful as it seems to be. So that's what my take on meditation. And in a sense, object-oriented programming is causing suffering to us, the developers, because instead of looking at reality, at data, at information, as it is, we put our mental model, object, and then we are stuck into an infinite complexity system. And but that's not that the data on itself or the information on itself is complex, is the tool, the object that we use to grasp data is causing the complexity. So in a nutshell, I would say that most of the complexity that we have in our program is accidental complexity. It's complexity that we have created because of our mental models. And it's not inherent complexity that has to do with the business domain. Mm-hmm. Can you give a, a concrete example of how object and object-oriented programming increase the complexity of our system? Yes. So let's take, a, in the book, I take a simple example, example of building a library management system. And let's say in the library, you have books and, and authors, and you can do many kinds of operations with books and authors. And in object-oriented, what you do is that you create an object that represents an author, And you have methods inside the objects to manipulate the author object. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you bundle together code and data or behavior and data creates complex hierarchy diagrams. Suddenly, many classes need to uh, import the author definition just in order to access a simple field from the author. Or if you want to create new author or an author with different fields, you have to create all the method of the author. Or if you want to test how a function or something behaves on an author, you have to create this complex object just to check for a little thing. Uh, sometimes we say that you want the banana, but instead of having the banana, you get the banana and the gorilla and the jungle. While you mm -hmm. only want the banana, only want the name of the author. And so how, how would I design that system? Let's stay with this library um, and, and the books. How would I design that in data-oriented uh, programming? How would that look differently? So it will be very uh, simple. First of all, you separate data from code. And now you ask yourself, how should I represent data? Mm -hmm. So you have stateless objects or modules for the behavior. And you have data with no methods, data objects or data classes or data maps for the data. And what is data? Most most of it is just uh, records. So it's maps or hash maps with fields and values. And that's it. So you represent your whole domain as a nested combination of maps and uh, arrays and integers and strings and kind of JSON, what JSON has brought to the world since it has been... Uh, adopted and not only in JavaScript, is simple tools to represent data. What do you have in JSON? You have strings, you have integers, uh, numbers, booleans, null to represent information that belongs to the real world. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so how would I structure the code um, in terms of files, for example? Would I, you know, where do I put all that data? information and the functional information. Do I have separate okay. files, two files, three files, ten files? <laughs> How does it yes. mean one file? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the thing that I didn't mention is that in data-oriented programming, we separate between the data representation and data validation. So mm -hmm. let me give you an example. When you create a book with a title and a publication year and the list of authors, you just create a map. You don't create a book object, mm -hmm. it's just a map. So you don't need any class to instantiate a new book. It's just an, a hash map. If you are in a language like JavaScript, Ruby, or Python, you have data literals for that. If you are in a language like Java or C Sharp or statically type language, you have a hash map constructor. Mm -hmm. So that's it. You don't need any uh, type definition mm -hmm. for the book. 
and you organize your functions as you would in a regular object oriented program, but it's the functions are much simpler because they are stateless. They always receive as an explicit argument the data that they manipulate. So there is no in implicit uh, this or self or reference to the object because there is no object. Okay. And so you were already talking a little bit about verification. And so for me, the first question that now comes to my mind is that actually with the typing, right, and that I can even create custom types and then, you know, enforce them in the system. This gives me somehow also security that a book actually is how I imagine a book to be. How do we have mm -hmm. that in data-oriented programming? Oh. How do we verify that it looks like this? Yes. And, you know, like because for yes. JSON, again, right, we have we have some... Um, simple types, but you know you could present me any data, and I'm not sure if yes, this is exactly, exactly. So you could, for example, receive a map yeah. that you think is a book, is a book, mm -hmm. and a book you expect it to have a field named title, and suddenly you get a map, and the field is named the title. Yeah. For example, so how are you going to deal with that? And that's a great question, and. Uh, the thing is that you deal with that like when you encounter surprises in the real world. So surprises happen in the real world. If you, over the wire, let's say you access an API and you ask for a book, and for some reason there is a bug in the API, in the server that serves the API, and you receive a book with the wrong field, you need to deal with that. And the types won't be helpful there. The types will just fail We'll try to pass the JSON into a book with a field title and there is no field title and you will have either an exception or a nice error message. So this is applicable exactly in the same way in data oriented programming. Uh, you define your schema in a schema language like JSON schema. Mm -hmm. You receive your data presented as a hash map and there are libraries in all languages that allow, allow you to validate a piece of data against a schema. Mm -hmm. So you validate. If it's valid, you move forward. If it's invalid, you deal with that by sending an error message to the user, by whatever, how you, you deal with that. But the important thing is that you embrace surprises. You don't assume that everything is going to work as expected. Like in real life, you know, you learn at university, you read books, you consult uh, professionals. But if then you expect that life will behave exactly as you have been taught, you are going to be quite upset. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the approach is that you embrace changes and surprises. So you have models, you have expectations, but you have little maps or glasses, but you don't confuse. There is a great quote that I uh, remember the, today or yesterday about the map is not the territory. Mm -hmm. So objects are like map. Schemas are like map. But Quite often in object-oriented programming, we tend to think that the map is the territory. There are no objects in the real world. The information about a book is not an object. It's a piece of information. You might decide to represent it as an object in your program. So that's your map, but that's not the territory. Mm -hmm. While in, when you represent your program, information about a book as a string map, just a map with keys and values, This is much, much closer to what it looks like for real. There is less of an impedance mismatch between how the information exists in the world and how you represent it in your program. So it's a, it's a move of humility in a sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think I get a good understanding of how it's different from object-oriented programming, but what's the difference to functional programming now? So where, where, you know, where do they overlap or where do they differ yeah, those two different great, ways? Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, they overlap functional programming and data oriented programming by both approach claim that we need to separate between code and data. So that's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to how should we represent data, in most functional programming languages like Haskell, OCaml, etc., you'd use custom types to represent data. While in data oriented programming, you don't use custom types. You use generic data structures. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. the main difference. And there is another uh, area where they overlap is that the data is immutable. In, in both in functional programming and in data oriented programming, 
We never ever mutate. We always create new versions of data to uh, manage changes. Okay. So one of the big benefits from data-oriented programming that you see is that we don't have the custom types. I'm a big custom type <laughs> person, right? So I'm, I'm always happy if I can create a type and, 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 and I have, you know, some enforcement around that. You know, you, you already described it to me, but still, what are some of the really cool things or why does it help me not to have the custom type and not such a strong typing system around what I'm doing? I'm going to... Uh... I'm going to send you back the question. What, mm -hmm. what is it that you like so much about types? Well, so we were thinking about complexity and I think I've never, not at least intentionally, <laughs> wrote a data-oriented program, right? So I can just go from my experience that I have so far. And I would say that um, strong typing helps me to avoid a lot of complexity around assuring that you know the, the thing that I'm getting is actually what I'm getting because it's already uh -huh. you know somehow even before it, it, it runs, right? So it's statically, yes, I can yes. statically uh, assure that this works. Now, if I right. remove that layer, I feel like yes. very insecure. I feel like, oh my God, yes, now I have yes. to write all this logic yes. that you describe of like, I'm, I'm dealing with this uncertain world and I have to uh -huh, check this uh -huh. and that. And I, I totally understand that this is somehow reality. But on the other hand, why do I have to create my reality more complex in, in my mind, right? More, more challenging, um, then it has to be because if I have the, the type system behind it, I can say, well, I know that this is a book and this is how it looks like and otherwise I will yeah. not receive it here. Perfect. Great question. Before I answer, let me ask you another <laughs> question. Do you also enjoy the, the kind of tooling and help that your IDE gives you when you have types autocomplete and uh, that you can never uh, mistype a field? Yes. Do you like? I actually yeah, do you like enjoy that, yeah. 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 And I like yeah. that I have a tooltip that I know, oh, these are the fields that I need. You know, like, I like that. Yes. I like all of that yeah. very much. Okay, perfect. So I, 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 I totally, what you say uh, totally resonate to me. Now, are there any things that you dislike with type or for you it's the best that uh, could be in the world? <laughs> <laughs> There are probably tons of things that I dislike, um, but now that uh, I have to think about it. Okay, let me challenge no, you. No, yeah, when but you, you have, probably can you tell have... me things that are annoying. Yeah, yeah, when you have, let's say, book record, mm -hmm. how easy it is with the static type, how easy it is to serialize it to JSON? Yeah, it depends. Um, if I need if I have a library, uh, <laughs> sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. For my experience, it's always hard with static typing. Yeah, there is no, there is no native way to take a record, a custom type, and to yeah. serialize it to, to JSON. You need always to hack something, to use reflection, yeah, or to do some kind of hack. Do you agree? It's not straightforward. It could be. It could be more straightforward. Yes, I agree. So if if your program, let's say you you you, you write a game mm -hmm. for playing with a library, mm -hmm. then you create the books, mm -hmm. and the books stay in the program. So you never need to externalize data. Mm -hmm. Then that's fine. I have nothing to say against types mm -hmm. because it's a closed system. But if the moment you need to externalize your information to other You yeah. need to, to go out of your types anyway. I never saw that as a real problem <laughs> because it's just you, another step you, of things that we have to do, right? Like, so How do you serialize? I'm curious. How do you serialize? Uh, let's say you have a, a nested uh, record that describes the whole library with uh, books and authors. How do you make from no, it? I'm not, no, I'm not saying that it, yeah, it definitely takes time, right? It takes time and effort and you have to write it, custom so do you write, write it. Custom? Your... Yeah, you yeah. write a custom uh, logic yeah. for any piece. Okay, so one challenge. Another challenge, let's say you mm -hmm. have a book. Yeah. And, and in the book, you have a field called title and a field publication year and a field author. And let's say you want to rename one of the field. You don't like book authors, you want to call it also, because that's how you need to send it over the wire for some reason. Okay. What are you going to do? Create a new type, exactly like this, the first type, 
So it's, it's going to be called book two, which is exactly like book, but just the field author is called the book author. I probably so, write so the wrapper, but <laughs> I'm not sure if this is, um, so usually right, ask there the is other a, person <laughs> to, usually there is, to a profusion, there is a yeah. profusion of types. Yeah. And each little module that needs to have a different look at the same data or a very uh -huh. similar data will create its own type. That's okay. the kind of complexity I'm, I'm referring to. Okay. There are types, there are interwined. Yeah. If different things, different glasses to, to look at the same reality. Another mm -hmm. example, let's say you have two modules that have the same exact same types with the exact same field but one type belongs to one module and one type belongs to another module now you have one by module a one by module b with the exact same field if you compare them the language will tell you it's not the same because it's a different type instance but the fields are the same so it's two glasses that looks at mm -hmm. the exact same reality so instead of comparing reality you compare your glasses Yeah, I think I probably would need a, a very concrete example to see the different instances of how you know, or when I encounter those problems. Um, but, I, but I see where you are heading towards. So what are the programs that you wrote or the mm -hmm. products that they created where all of those challenges that you describe have been so predominant that data-oriented uh, programming really made sense? And how did you switch yeah. from, you know, like probably had like already a code base. So how do we go from that code base that we have to a data-oriented code base? What what yeah. steps do we need here? So, yeah. So what, uh, if you take a look at the book, you will see that basically data-oriented programming is made of four core principles. Each of them can be, um, you don't have to apply all of them. You can apply principle number one of data oriented mm -hmm. programming and change your code base according only to this principle. So mm -hmm. for example, you would take a class that combines code and data mm -hmm. and split it into two classes, one for the code, one for the data. And it will be already, it will have a beneficial impact. It will lower the complexity of your class diagram. After that, you can say, okay, this piece of data, maybe I can represent it as a hash map instead of creating my custom type and see if it makes sense. Maybe something that you need to send over the wire as JSON instead of creating a custom type and then a custom uh, JSON serializer, you could take a look and say, okay, this, it will make sense to leave it as a hash map. And then you mm -hmm. get the serialization, JSON transition for free. The third principle, you can Uh, play with schema languages like JSON schema and see how it looks like to define the schema of your API. And mm -hmm. then, for example, you have a, I don't know, a REST endpoint that expects a payload with a specific shape. You define the payload uh, of the request in JSON schema and you validate that the request that you receive correspond to the schema. And finally, the last principle, the you can avoid mutation. And instead of mutating in place, you try to create, when it makes sense, new version of data and see if it helps in terms of state management. And But it also means that it plays nicely together. We can have an object-oriented or functional uh, programming uh, environment or system and then add yes, parts yes. that are benefiting from the data-oriented paradigm yes, and, and, and yes. transfer that into, into that. Yeah, you could have an object-oriented programming style or language embracing the data-oriented programming paradigm. Okay. But, uh, but they can still live together, right? So I can have like mm -hmm. a, a large part of my code base has uh, objects and works in this object-oriented yes. way. And as you said, maybe I'm taking just parts of some of those objects and separate yes. data from, from logic and so on. Yes. Um, yes. And, but and the, the rest will still be very um, OO, right? Very object-oriented. Yes, yes. yes. And my, that would be the advice I would give to someone, not to adopt the board directly, but to try when it, it makes sense. And if you, mm -hmm. it's a place where you are really scared, if you don't have your types, that's fine. Don't, don't start from this place. Okay. Another question that I had for you is that I I, <laughs> I wanted to say data intensive application and uh, in in our pre uh, pre recording session you said no no don't say data intensive application say 
um, information systems. Why? What's the difference for you here? Um, I think I grasp it now a little bit. Uh, I, I think probably it has to do that it doesn't have to be data intensive. We can just have normal <laughs> data uh, usage. But what? Why do you prefer information systems and not data intensive applications? Yeah, that's a great question. When I hear the word information, it, it's clear to me that it's something that exists uh, outside my program. Mm -hmm. Information could be in a database, information could be in a program, it could be in a file, it could be in, in the in the real world. And when, when you say data intensive application, to me, it sounds like something at scale with lots of data, lots of traffic. Data data programming has nothing to say about how to manage data at scale. Okay. It has to say how to represent data in a simple way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of systems have databases at least, right? <laughs> like there are, uh, there are probably applications that don't have a lot of information. They don't need a database, but I don't know many. <laughs> no, no. I <laughs> mean, they need a database. But, right? yeah. but what I mean is that the scale doesn't have to be, the throughput doesn't have to be big. I, 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 I understand. Were, yeah. Yeah, of course. There so is a database for every, and there so is a... actually, every application that has or deals with data and information that stores it somehow, retrieves it somehow, transforms yes, exactly. it. Exactly. It would be interesting to look at data-oriented programming in your mind, or are there some specific kind of applications that you would say benefit more? Any application that uh, that is in the stack of what we call full-stack development, front-end, yeah. back-end, worker. Uh, will be it will be benefit. I think where it doesn't make any difference, with, it won't benefit is if you want to write a compiler or to write a game engine or something mm -hmm. that is lives in a closed ecosystem. Yeah, where you you have no surprises. If your data never surprises you, and you don't need to send it to other, you don't need data oriented programming. Mm -hmm. but yeah, if you I like communicate, that. That's very clear. If, if you communicate with data to different mm -hmm. systems that use different programming languages, then it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So the last question I have for you is uh, about the style of the book, actually. So your book is actually written a little bit differently. It's, it's, it's a story, right? It's a story and uh, the whole information, the learning experience is actually guided through um, personas, characters that are doing something. Why did you choose to write the book that way, um, which is very different from other technical books? Yeah, so there are several reasons. One of them is that I like stories. Mm -hmm. And I need to admit, it's difficult for me to read technical books. It's very difficult. I get uh, bored or I fall asleep. Uh, and when I read a story, I'm, I'm entertained, I'm energized. Mm -hmm. So... I wanted to invent a story, but it's it's tricky to make a story in the context of technical uh, material. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to, uh, I had this idea in the back of my mind. And then when I wrote the first chapter as a regular chapter, I struggled with uh, finding the proper tone. I was either too enthusiastic and too selling or too boring. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to deal with the objections that I know the readers will have. So I played a little game between me and myself. And I had a part of me that played the data oriented programming mentor and other part of myself that would play the object oriented developer. I made little discussions between them. So the mentor would say, types are problematic. And then the developer said, but why? I like types. It brings me safety. Uh -huh. And then he challenged me. Then I, I needed to answer his question. Oh, that's what but, you did with me today. <laughs> yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah. I was already prepared. And sometimes it, uh, I felt like kind of schizophrenic. Like I yeah. have two personalities. Uh, but for me, it was the best, the best way I found to, to deal with questions. And uh, many readers told me that Quite often, when they read the book, in their mind, they see that the, the character asks the question just the moment the question arises in their mind. In their mind. So, yeah. 
that's how I decided to make dialogues between the characters. And then I said, okay, now I have the dialogues, but they are going to talk forever with no context. So sometimes I put them in the coffee shop and sometimes in the university and sometimes in the office and sometimes in the park and sometimes in the countryside. And then I made a little story around the, the characters in their that journey toward enlightenment. Yeah. And so Manning, right, this is a Manning uh, book. Manning has this uh, pre-access, uh, early access oh, yes. thing, yeah? And you have people that actually read already your book and you're getting feedback. Do they like the, this kind of new style? Uh, are they surprised? Yes. Um, I think they are surprised and they, they like it and they comment on it and uh, they, they provide very useful feedback and it allows me to improve the book while while I'm, I'm writing. I also have a reader from, uh, as you may have guessed, I'm not a native American speaker. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a, I was born in France and I have a, a friend in, a, in Boston, I think, that liked the book and offered me to review the whole book and reformulate it in proper English. Oh, nice. That's very good. And, uh, we had uh, two weeks of fun together. I would send him the chapters and he would send me reviews and comments. And and it moved beyond only correcting the English. It, it suggested little changes to the story, to the setup, to the characters. That was one of my uh, best experience, my, my best interaction with, uh, with uh, readers, that they yeah, actually participated nice. in the book. They yeah, contributed cool. to the book. That's it's like cool, open yeah. source. It's like an open source book in a sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, That's no, a collaborative nice. book. Yeah. And so this actually brings me to the end of our episode. And I want to remind our listeners that they can win a book. You are giving away one copy. Um, they have to retweet and like this episode um, to have this chance. And then um, in a week... 10 days later, I will, you know, raffle and uh, pick one lucky person that can read the whole story and uh, find out where the characters all are around and how they are discussing <laughs> the pros and cons of data-oriented programming. So, uh, Johanathan, thank you so much for being at my show. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. And, um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Michaela. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. This was another episode of the Software Engineering Unlocked podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please help me spread the word about the podcast. Send the episode to a friend via email, Twitter, LinkedIn, well, whatever messaging system you use, or give it a positive review on your favorite podcasting platform such as Spotify or iTunes. This would mean really a lot to me. So thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and I will talk to you in two weeks. Bye.